And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, where I am thrilled, and I always say I'm thrilled a lot, but I'm actually legitimately, I'm not lying at all, thrilled to be joined by basketball fan, stand-up comedian, fresh off a wildly successful special called The Great Depression, which everybody should have watched already or should watch now. Gary Goldman, how are you? I'm so good. I'm I'm great, and also the Great Depression has a basketball ending. I sh- I shoot baskets at at the end. We're going to talk about that. Yes, it's, I I you know I would have you on anyway, or try I to. Appreciate. That. I like having awesome people on. <laughs> Thanks. But but anytime there's a when I watched it, and then there was clearly like a basketball theme running through it. Right. I turned to my wife who was watching with me. It's like I'm I'm going to try and get this guy on. Cause, oh, that's cause, awesome. Because we got I got an excuse. I got an. Oh yeah, of course. Yes. So so. But I was a fan before I think you knew of me. Probably. No, I knew of you. Okay. I knew of All right, you. That's good. But right. this special, I think, well, let's just start with that. Have, okay. Has you, have you already, so it's run on HBO, it's on demand, but it's, it's, yeah, it had it's a limited HBO run, Go right? And, it's and, still, okay, yeah. it's on demand. I think sometimes it airs in regular times, but I don't know anybody who watches HBO during regular times. Like it, it's, it's, for me, it's an app, really. Yeah. Ha- have you already gotten the sense that this is a life changing yeah. moment for you? Yes. Yeah, career changing, life changing, and it's it's more than I I expected. I knew there was the potential to help a lot of people just from the the live shows that I was doing. That people would come up to me and and give me really really positive feedback, and also feel comfortable opening up to me about their their struggles, which is which is so interesting because I held off on telling anybody about this for years because I didn't think anybody else would really or very few people would relate and then you find out, oh no, everybody is connected to this this depression, anxiety treatment story in some way. They're either themselves or, or through a family member or or a friend. And just the the opportunities that I, I've gotten because of this, I, I'm like I'm running around today meeting with with book publishers about writing a book, not about the Great Depression, but about this other idea I have, which which the sensibility of the Great Depression is going to be in the in the book which is that i i can talk about my life in a in a funny way so it's more of a memoir about about some of the components of of the great depression in that i i have this weird memory of my my life since i was four or five years old i can remember all these events so i don't know if you have a friend who remembers everything for you but i'm i'm that friend that whenever anybody says who did we have in third grade and who was the girl who stuck her finger in the pencil sharpener and they and she bled and they had to call the the emts and i know the name and the and the grade and and who the teacher was and and it's not a curse because it's not usually for trauma as much as it is for trivia. <laughs> so that so that's really good. I've been able to get past certain traumatic things in my in my youth, but but the trivia of my youth and and also with sports. I mean, that's a weird thing is my memory for for sports and athletes and statistics and and things for from from 5 to till college. I mean, incredible. And then now I I, I only remember championships. I I knew every final four team from like 1970 and then in around 99 1999 i i stopped memorizing that i think that's called so, adulthood yes i've had a similar experience really? where like yeah i used to be and i'm always envious like bill simmons my friend and, and former boss oh he's, he's amazing yeah, he'll just be oh like, my word one of the one of the my flashball memories of like this is how good bill is it's like we we go to all-star and he just sets up a room for podcast guests because all the players are kind of torn around this yeah, hotel. Right. And most of them are booked in advance. But sometimes he'll just see somebody and he'll be like, <laughs> hey, you got 15 minutes? Like, let's come on in. And he got Bill Fitch to come in, the coach wow. of the Celtics. Oh, yeah, yeah. Nets, Clippers, NBA on and champion. 80-81. Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Amazing coach. And, and also coached a, a very weak Cleveland team to the playoffs. That's right. Yes. And so Bill Fitch comes in. No preparation. We didn't even know Bill Fitch was there. Wow. And he sits down and, and Simmons is like, so I remember – 1980 draft. You guys had the 17th. I'm just making this up. You guys <laughs> right, had right, the 17th right, right. Yeah. pick, yeah. and so and so was available, yeah. and you wanted so and so, and this guy. And I know it's Celtics, so everyone thinks Bill, of course, he remembers this no. stuff. But it's like I don't remember like his no. memory for that no. kind of stuff it's, is unbelievable. It's, it's incredible. But that's where I discovered you on on the original BS report. The BS report. Yeah. So basketball. Run, so for people who have not seen this, first of all, it's hilarious. Go go watch it. Um, and it essentially is uh, an hour and 15 minute stand up set. Yes about a severe 
depression and anxiety for which you went to the hospital. Yeah. You underwent all sorts of therapies and you've come out the other side. Yeah. Feeling much better about life. But th- that, I mean, and it's not, it's not depression. Like ah, I'm kind of in a bad mood now, and then this is serious. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You couldn't go. Yeah, you, yeah, you I was thought about virtually catatonic. Yeah, you thought about retiring, which yes. is a great bit about yes. how retiring yes. is a little pretentious for what yes. you were. <laughs> right, um, and it's moving and it's funny. Basketball is a theme that runs through it. You are six six. Yes, played basketball essentially your whole life. Yeah, and you have a bit in the in the movie. Not it's not a bit. You said basketball is really the sport for depressives yes. because you can practice it alone. Yes, that's not a joke though, right? Like I no. really think that's part of the appeal of I basketball. Yeah, I I think it's it's so important because it is it is meditative and it's also like practicing an, an instrument to a certain extent. I, I think I think that's why people compare basketball to jazz a lot because there's so much improvisation in in basketball and there there are only a, I mean there are infinite ways you can pass a football but it seems like there are even more ways to pass a, a basketball and and also to to dribble it's it's just it's such a beautiful game but i was initially drawn to it for two things one i didn't like the more contact heavy sports when i was when i was young i didn't want it i was a pretty passive kid i never played football myself yeah. i never had i didn't have any interest in getting Harmed, yes. like like having other people whose goal was to harm me was not right. interesting to me. Well, I, I remember when I was six or seven, there was a player for the for the New England Patriots named Daryl Stingley who was paralyzed by an opposing fellow by the name of Jack Tatum, and I remember thinking. Oh, and they're gonna keep playing football after this <laughs> happened. I, I I can't believe that. And so I was, I I really didn't want that to happen to me. And so when I found out basketball had had rules that if you really hit somebody, then then you would get free free shots, and that they they could eventually be thrown out of the game for hitting too many people. <laughs> I I was I was drawn to it. And then when I found out that, oh, you can practice by yourself, you can go to the park with the ball and if nobody's there, you can just shoot around and it's, and it's exhilarating and, and, and then you find everything as a, is a hoop. So you sh- I'm shooting at walls, I'm shooting at the roof of the house and, and just dribbling around and then, and then I, I was able to go to basketball camps as a, as a kid. Mike Jarvis, who was the, Patrick Ewing's high school coach had a while while Ewing was in high school he had a a camp that I went to and and I don't think it's for everyone but sports camps are a great way to solve racism because a lot of the kids that I went to school with had never met a, a black person and then you go to basketball camp and you're around people that you don't have in your everyday life and you realize oh they're just like they're just like me and and I think this it goes a long way and and sports in general goes a long way in, in solving a lot of problems this like is why that. whenever you know debates about affirmative action and stuff like that yeah. comes up and people are like oh that's just diversity for diversity's sake and my response is diversity for diversity's sake is like unbelievably yes. valuable uh, like it, that's enrichment for that's, enrichment's sake that's the whole yeah. thing is just like yes. meet other people who are not yes. like you and yes. it changes the way you perceive the whole Yes. World. Like if, it's if education. That's, if that's the only thing it's for, then that's tremendously valuable. That's more valuable than a Shakespeare class yes. at Harvard or something. Such a great point. Such a great point. How do you, that's all it does is diversify. I mean, that's all it has to. So, so what was your ritual as a kid? Was there a park you went to? Did you only want to shoot by yourself? Like if people were on the court, we'd be like, oh man, I got to wait for these people to get off. Well, I, I would say shortly after I, I got into basketball my brother put up a hoop on a on a pole in front of our house my mom worked at sears so she got a discount on a on a hoop and we we bought a it was just a, a regular pole and he he was really good with his hands and then some neighborhood kid or a vandal ripped the hoop off the off the backboard and my brother designed this thing so that i could take the hoop off the backboard at night Ah, and using a garden rake, one of those steel garden rakes, I could remove the hoop and put it in the garage at night and then put it back the next day. And so the only thing was that it was a little bit rattly. So if you, if you didn't swish it, it would probably bounce out, but that was good. good that, that's good, good practice. That's good for, for shooting. And so I practiced a lot at that. And then when I got good enough, I started going to this, this park near my house and I would ride my bike and it was about a two mile bike ride and I would go play there and there were some really good good players there that I wound up playing with and through high school 
so that was that was really something I, I was very lucky to have good good parks near my house and 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 my whole thing was that I would just I would wear through basketball so quickly because I was I was dribbling all the time I, there were so many great stories about guys like Larry Bird and Pistol Pete Maravich being obsessed with their basketball that you didn't feel like a freak by by practicing all the time there was a there was a really there, there couldn't have been a better time in Boston sports history to be into basketball than than when Larry yeah, Bird Yeah you're was a there. kid in the 80s yeah. the, and you're not you're uh, I'm 42 so yeah, I was I'm 49 Yeah so you were of the perfect age perfect the age 80s. so like I was Simmons. a little too young to appreciate yeah. I mean I I I appreciated it but I, I was like so I was born in 77 so I was 9 or about to turn 9 and when okay. the 86 team won right. so the 81 team for instance I have yes. no memory of that yes. at all Yes oh my gosh that team was incredible the 81 team is it was incredible so good. Mikhail is a rookie. Who was your favorite of the 80 Celtics? I think that I, I didn't want to like the same guy that everybody else liked. So I, I really like Gerald Henderson. Interesting. <laughs> well, yeah. famous steal. <laughs> he, th- that's a bigger steal than Havlicek, really. I, I've always, I've always yeah, wanted they don't to win have that this, without that this win. debate because Havlicek sealed the game and it was very exciting. But they don't win that game against the Lakers in in '84, and they don't win that game in '84. I don't know that they win that series. I don't think Simmons will kill me for saying this. They shouldn't have won that series. The Lakers were better in '84, I think. And Certainly. that series, they need a lot of luck to come. I mean, every team needs a lot of luck. Although they almost team. won it in six games. That's true. Yeah, Gerald Henderson. I always gravitated to McHale. Oh. I just I liked his low post yeah. moves. I loved his game. And and then as I grew to be an adult and read about those teams. I liked Mikhail even more because Bird was like the serious assassin competitor. Yeah. And Mikhail was like the normal guy yes. who Bird would be like, I don't understand how you're not as crazy and com- maniacal as I am. Yes. And I was like, I kind of like the normal guy. Yes. Yes. Mikhail was the guy everybody could relate to because he, he was, he was, there was either him or Cedric Maxwell used to have the Logan Airport PA make a PA announcement paging Dolph Shays. I don't think I've ever heard this story. Yeah. And maybe Mikhail used to do it to make Maxwell laugh or Maxwell used to do it to make Mikhail laugh. But either way, I thought that is something that Larry Bird would not do. He was he was too serious. Although a very funny guy from what I can tell. People, do you ever feel like ticketing websites make getting to the event difficult on purpose? It's as if they're so big they can get away with not caring about the customer experience, the only thing they should actually care about. But with millions of live event tickets and a price match guarantee, that's important, SeatGeek proves there's a better way. You can search for sports, live music, comedy, Broadway, more. I've even used them for Broadway plays. SeatGeek has the tickets you're looking for all in one place. They built the fastest way to find tickets. So you can stop searching for the perfect seat and start enjoying it. Your days of scouring 20 websites on the secondary market are over. SeatGeek pulls together millions of tickets from all over the web. It rates each deal on a scale of 1 to 10 and displays them on an interactive seat map. Super easy to use. Green dots mean good deals. Red dots, maybe less good deals. Every purchase is fully guaranteed. That's important. You can shop for tickets with confidence. I have the SeatGeek app on my phone, and it's by far the fastest and easiest way to find tickets. SeatGeek will even give you $10 off your first purchase. Bam, all you need to do is use our promo code. Download the SeatGeek app today and use promo code LOW, L-O-W-E, my last name, the name of this podcast, for $10 off your first purchase. That's promo code LOW for $10 off your first purchase with SeatGeek. So you have this amazing special that's emotional and funny and personal, and uh, it begins with a clip of a stand-up special in Boston from 2017, I think, which is a sort of rock right. bottom moment it, yeah. where you're sort of telling the audience, you've reached a point where you're just going to say out loud what you're going through. <laughs> yes. And then you end the special. So you've clearly paid great artistic attention to all, how am I starting, how am I ending. You end, the credits are rolling as you're playing on a blacktop court yes. by yourself. Yes. And I immediately recognize it as the Sigma move. You're doing Sigma oh, yes, practicing yes. Sigma, Jack Sigma inside yeah. pivots. And I turned to my wife and I said, he's doing the Sigma. And yeah. she was like, I don't know what, what that is. That's so and I'm funny. Like, it's a move that really only diehard footwork experts. Like, they're, like I, 
I last year in one of my columns, I complimented Nikola Vucevic's footwork. Oh yeah, and and I called him and we talked about Amazing his footwork. Amazing footwork. And yes. then I sent him a text. I was like, Hey, have you ever tried the Sigma move before? And he and Nikola Vucevic was like, I don't know what that is. What is really? that? And I sent him a clip of Hubie Brown teaching a group of players the Sigma move. Was it during red on round ball? I no, it was like a <laughs> clinic. He's like wow. on stage at a clinic, and Vuce was like, I gotta try this in a game. Yes. I don't know they actually did it. So how do you make the decision? That's the thought I want to leave viewers with. That's that's the image. That's what I want to leave people with. I will tell you the entire story, and I, I wish I had. It's all subconscious and also a great director and editor. But the first day we did documentary footage, we, we weren't with HBO. Judd Apatow had just given us some money to shoot a day, and we were going to use that to try and to try and sell it to HBO. So we had a day of shooting and I, and he said, I would like to interview you and your friend from when you were in, since we've been in sixth grade, we met on a basketball court. I said, we should, we should meet there at the basketball court and we'll talk while we, while we shoot baskets or near the court. I think it's a good backdrop. And, and he agreed. And, so we we shot that day. We didn't wind up using any of the interview with my with my friend. Later on that year, I wrote jokes specifically about my love of basketball and how it related to my loneliness and depression and also about the bad basketball game that I had which led me to my first contemplation of suicide. We're going to talk about that. Right. So we had that footage before I even wrote any jokes about basketball and then the director showed me a cut where over the credits, instead of the initial idea was to put the end of the show where I do a meet and greet after the show, put that as the ending, which, which is natural and it made sense, but he really liked the look of the basketball and the, and sort of the, the ease and the, and the, the, the carefree nature of just shooting baskets by, by myself near my new home in, in New York. So that, that worked out great. When I first saw it, I was, I was really blown away. I said, this is how we, we should end it. And then I have this friend who wrote an amazing song that the director happened to listen to and said, this is the perfect song to go over the, over the basketball scene. So it was, it was so much luck, good fortune, and, and maybe some, some subconscious, but, the, the Sigma move was something that I learned early and I noticed throughout my basketball, even just playing at the park, you could always get an open shot if you did the, if you did the Sigma move. People, because, cause it's, it, it's the opposite. It's an inside pivot and yeah. no one expects an inside nope. pivot. Nope. And there's so many moves off the Sigma move. An up fake and a drive, an up fake and, and a shot or just a shot right away. You're gonna get that first shot because they don't even know what you just did. And I see a lot of guys, they don't even call it the Sigma move anymore. They just call it squaring up. But I see, I see a lot of guys do it on the perimeter. But Sigma, I mean, wow, it was perfect. Did you really shoot 94% from the free throw line as a senior in high school? Probably 88%. Okay. Yeah, but 94% is funnier. It's it, more absurd. It is funnier. Yeah. Yeah. I just remember every year we would have this thing where the, we had like eight baskets in our gym in, in high school. It was a really big high school and everyone on the team would get a basket and you would shoot free throws. And if you missed, you were out. If you kept making them, you would win $5 from the coach. And I did it in 10th grade. I did it in 11th grade and I did it in 12th grade. I never missed. In fact, I, the, by my senior year, I said, why don't you guys see how many you can make in a row and then I'll just go out there and top it so we don't all have to, to stand all there. Right. And it was, and, and we did it much quicker because that was like the, that was the Christmas break treat from my, my coach who was the, the biggest asshole I've ever met in my life. Really? My high school basketball coach was the worst person I've ever like been involved just with. A, like an old school. He was, a, it wasn't even old school because usually old school guys are X and O's and they know their, they know their strategy and they yeah. know their calls and they're, and they're, they're serious about basketball. This guy was just mean, gratuitously mean for the sake of, of being mean. He was Bobby Knight without the genius strategist and Bobby Knight is as much of a, a 
monster he was. He was actually a very intelligent man, and this man was not he was not an intellectual like like Bob Knight. I mean so Bob that, Knight is a monster, but at least those kids got better at basketball. I, I was worse by the time I left. He so that's, ruined my that's game. not in your special. He's not mentioned in your special no, your football no, stuff is mentioned. No. So but did that did that My football coach was a was a mensch and a gem and and went out of his way to 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 help me and, and changed my life. But my basketball coach was just the worst person. Did it make it worse? Mm-hmm. Yeah, because I loved basketball and he took that away from me when I was in high school. That's awful. I dreaded practice. Yeah. There's no worse feeling than dreading something that you yeah. just have to do for like several hours a day. Like yes. the feeling of just, yes. Uh, and then it's over and you're relieved yeah. and you're relieved. And then it, I used to feel that way about swim practice. Just the swim practice was just long and arduous. Oh and like, my God. It's just like physical torture. For right. Three yeah. Hours. Yeah. Um, and you've been up since six o'clock in the morning. Yes. Yeah. Um, so your your comedy is very writerly, and and not <laughs> Thank you. not it, it's it's just and and this is going to come across in two ways that I want to talk about. You already mentioned this, so you have two moments in your special where you make really really funny jokes. I mean, most of the topics of your special are not funny, right? Depression is not funny, right? But there are two moments that are like especially not funny at all, uh-huh. and you make jokes out of them. So the first one is the game you mentioned before. Uh, where you play yeah. for your local synagogue against right. your local junior high team, and you feel the pressure of playing for the Jews, as you put it in, you, <laughs> in the <laughs> Playing special. for my people, yeah. And, and you and you're o for eighteen or something like yeah. this, and you go home, and you look in the medicine cabinet, and you find a bottle of what you think are sleeping pills. Yeah. And you're like, twelve, thirteen years old, whatever it is. Yeah. And you're you have the thought of if I take enough of these, yeah, I'd probably kill myself. Yeah. Maybe I should do that. Yeah. That is not funny at all. No, like, it's so I don't know sad. how you even look at that moment and think, well, I could write some jokes off that, but you do and they're funny. And the joke is you look at the pills and you start making fun of how the pills look like they're old, they're rusty, which is a yeah. wonderful <laughs> word. And the bottle doesn't have a cap. It has a cork. So like you to take that moment and make it funny not only strikes me as difficult, but strikes me as something that a lot of people would not even conceive of to do. So like, how do you arrive at that place where you're like, I want to write jokes about that time? Right. Well, when we were designing or developing the, the story of the Great Depression, because all my stand up before this had been just a collection of jokes and they were, they were strong jokes, but there was not really a through line. And, and the director, Mike Bonfiglio, who did the 30 for 30, Doc and Daryl, mm-hmm. and he directed You Don't Know Bo, about Bo Jackson. Both very good really, ones. Yeah, really good ones. I, all of the 3030s. There wasn't one that I wasn't blown away by. Anyhow, he would ask me, he would just say, one thing was he gave me license. It doesn't have to be funny, he said. We'll figure out a way. Either we'll put it in the documentary portion and get to it that way, but if you can make it funny, that's that's ideal. He said, were there, were there any times in your life when you were suicidal and i said well i remember the first time and it was over this basketball game in a, uh, against the synagogue and he said try to write something about that and then i would i would go try it out on my tour and i would send him the audio and he would listen to it and he would give me just this great feedback and you and you know from working with editors and and people who are giving you feedback on your work you can tell when they're being nice and when they're being honestly enthusiastic and i and i could tell i was like oh he really he really liked that otherwise he would be honest enough in a gentle way to tell me yeah keep keep digging and so i i came up with that story and he really liked it and and also there was this license where he said it doesn't have to be funny but there's part of me that is most comfortable when the audience is laughing and not just just looking at me so that that was the the motivation for, for did that you one feel did it did any part of you feel strange making a joke about a moment like that yeah there, there's that moment because there were nights when the people were just not in the in the mood when they didn't they didn't laugh at that. They they thought it was it was heartbreaking and it, because and it sad. is it, because yeah. it is yeah. And I had to learn to be to be comfortable with that and not and not immediately start melting down on stage because I didn't get a laugh for thirty seconds. But there was there was one moment where I thought this might be trivializing or offensive to people in the world of suicide, depression, or suicide attempts, where I where I talked about how I 
thought about suicide many times but didn't want to write a note and it was because of a lifelong aversion to essays so this that was, started with the SATs. This was the second and, one that yeah, I was going to ask about. And I, I went, Mike, the director, said, I think you should do that on, on the show. And I said, I'll do it the sh- night of the show, but before we release it, I want to check with the National Foundation for Suicide Prevention to see if that's going to be... I know people get very, very sensitive about the use of the word trigger, but I said that might upset people and it's not worth it for one, for one laugh to make people feel really terrible. It's not, it's not worth it to me. I'm, that's not the type of, of show that I wanted to, that I wanted to put on. And, and we, we let them see it before we released it and they said it was fine. So that was the, that was the okay I needed, but I, I was I was trepidatious about that because I I, I felt that it, it could be construed as as being rather rather blithe about something so serious. So, so I'll tell you how I how I reacted to it. So the joke kind of comes out of nowhere yes. to the show, which which yes. really, which makes the impact even harder. You're just talking about essays. Yeah. College essays, how you yes. barely could get your act together to apply yes. to college right. because you don't want to write essays. Then yeah. there's like a pause. You're like in a, in a lot of ways, I, I do feel like my aversion to essays repeatedly saved my life. And right then, before you explain it, the audience begins to realize where you're going with this. Yeah, you're going to talk about suicide notes and how you didn't want to write a suicide note because. And I found it riotously funny. Oh, that's good. Like yeah. my my the initial people in the crowd loved it. My, I was really I was really thankful for that. My yeah. initial reaction was riotous laughter, and then I thought to myself. Boy, that's not funny at all. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, like, that's a very yeah. dark, dark it's thought. Really and dark. it takes some guts to be like, I can, ex- for exactly the reason you said, I can tread the line of making a joke out of this, but not trivializing what is at yes. the heart of it. And yeah. that's very, very hard to do. Yeah. I was really careful about that. And, and in, in the long run, I, I didn't think it would be worth it. If, if the group had said, no, that's, that's a bit much, I would have, I would have taken it out and, and, the the whole thing when you write is that you have to be willing to to get rid of the stuff which shows confidence that you can come up with better stuff or different stuff so so I don't mind at this point earlier on in my career I've been like I can't write another joke sometimes for inspiration you just have to look up for more than 60 years the Goodyear blimp has fueled greatness on the gridiron by providing aerial coverage of some of the most legendary moments in college football history when the Goodyear blimp rises above a stadium and inspires players to reach higher and rise to the challenge of the game's biggest moments. Now it's your turn to go further with Goodyear. Discover tires made to rise above the rest. Learn more at Goodyear.com. Goodyear, more driven. They say the best offense is a good defense. I, I think actually some people do say that. And that's especially true when it comes to the fuel you put in your car. It's time to help keep your engine running like new. Shell V-Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline is engineered to defend against four main engine threats. Not one, not two, not three, but four. Gunk, wear, corrosion, and friction. The four evils. It's our most advanced fuel ever, protecting your engine like a solid stiff arm, a huge hit, or a last-second block like LeBron on Andre Iguodala. Like, defensive lines on all premium fuels are the same. Now that is fuel for thought. And if you're a Fuel Rewards member... You save at least five cents per gallon on every fill up with gold status. That's that can add up. If you're not a member, download the Fuel Rewards app or go to fuelrewards.com to join and never ever ever pay full price for gas again. In engines that continuously lose, sh- let me do this part again. In engines that continuously use Shell V Power Nitro Plus Premium Gasoline. So that's one of the things I'm always curious about: a comedy special. Yeah. So you obviously know the night that this is the night. Yeah, we're taping the special tonight. Right. So, like, what happens if you get ten minutes in, and you're arriving at one of your home run jokes, yeah. and you just like botch a syllable oh. or or trip over a word? Like, Great do you get question. do you get a second chance to Great do that? Question. Yes and yes. Okay, so you you tape two shows and they mix it together. You just buy two shirts so that you're wearing the same outfit in in both shows and. The the thing that I regret is that my hair was so long, so I had to I had to push it back so that it would look the same on both shows because if your hair is long, it moves around too much. So I would have had a shorter haircut. So lesson learned. But before I went on, and I don't like to name drop, but I I think this is helpful. J- Judd Apatow, who who produced it, and I I always 
feel resentful when people go on talk shows and talk about Judd or Lorne just by their first right. name. Right. Like, I know that that's what they call them, but I always feel left out. Like, oh, I'd like to be able to call Lorne <laughs> Lorne. And I, and I, and I always, so I, I'm careful to always use the last name. So anyhow, Judd Apatow, before I taped, he, he was in my dressing room and he said, listen, treat the special like it's a film. If you flub a line, stop, tell the audience you're going to do it again. And he says, I promise you they won't mind and they might even find it entertaining and interesting that you're, that you're doing that. And he said also, and luckily this didn't happen, he said, if you're bombing, pretend that the joke did well enough that there's a little bit of a space between <laughs> the time you finish the joke and the audience stops laughing. So, so leave a gap so that if we have to, we can add it. But luckily it was a hot audience. I've had audiences on specials where I, where I would have liked to have left some space so they could have added laughs because it didn't, it didn't sound, it didn't sound great. But that, that was such great advice right before the show and it, it freed me up so that I didn't have to get it exactly right the first time. And, and also th I only used it once. There's this list of, of, of antidepressants that I took. None of which are easy to pronounce. Right. And, and some of them have to be in a certain order. So the first time I went through it, I, I got stuck and I said, let me take that again. And then I did it again and the audience was, was very proud of me. So they applaud at the end, but it wasn't, that wasn't natural, I don't think. But that was the only time I had to take something again. You clearly pay a lot of attention to the precise wording of your jokes, which we're oh, going to yeah. talk about. The word, yeah. the word use is so strong. Um, but then th you also have to be able to, to ad lib and, um, you have a moment, we talked about this over lunch a couple weeks ago, where you talk about that millennials get so much flack. Yeah. For, what did they get flack for? I can't remember. Uh, participation trophies. Participation trophies. By the way, yes. fantastic bit about the, the people who think that participation trophies are terrible, where you're yeah. like, yeah. you know, how are they gonna, uh, how are they gonna get used to failure, you know? Yeah. How are like, they gonna like, learn how to lose? How are they gonna learn how to lose? Yeah. How about life? How about yes. living? Like they're gonna lose like all the time yes. in life. That's it's what It's all life losing. Is. Um, and then you have this moment where like, yeah, millennials take so much flack. And all that guff that they take, you know, they take the flack and the guff. And I don't know which is worse, the flack or the guff. That's all ad lib you yeah, told me. Yeah, yeah. What's your, what's the best ad lib either in the show or of your career? The line that just like the moment that I, I don't like that. Oh. When you know, like that, that was just, that was a fantastic little ad that I did off the top of my head. Cause huh. that was a good, the flack and the guff. Right. I found very, very funny. Oh, thanks, man. Yeah. I don't, I, I would have to think about that. And I don't, I don't think we have, time but my my best ad lib on on stage i mean the th that line was a was a good ad lib the night of the the show and then there was something else that i ad libbed like the week of the show oh where i say that i'm not concerned about the impotence associated with my antidepressants and i ad libbed on one of the final shows of my tour, I said, I said, oh, like I'm having so much sex in the fetal position. That was an ad lib? Yeah. That was a good, that's a good yeah, joke. Yeah, that was a strong ad lib. So from the special, those were probably the two best ad libs. So here are some words um, that you used in the routine. You have a bit about, again, you're seven years older than me, but boy, did this ring true. And it rang true like I had never even thought about it before, but it still rang true, which is very rare. How when we were kids, no one like talked to you about how much water you had to drink. And there was, <laughs> there, there was never water. No, we had, didn't, didn't have any water filters. Nobody right. was constantly on top of you about being hydrated. And so yeah. you have a bit about drinking from the fountain after gym class. Yeah. And, um, and the words that you use in the bit are so strong because you talk about how um, bullies would try to smash your head into the water, the water yeah. fountain. Yeah. Uh, and you, but you don't just say that. You say Cretans would try to smash your head into the iron spout. Yeah. Cretans smash spout. <laughs> I mean, those words are spout is such a much better word than fountain yeah. then you talk about how the teacher would count like everyone's got to take their turn so the teacher would count you out of your right yeah. uh, drinking but you don't just say count you out of your drink you say limit your quench ha! quench is the reason that that joke is funny yeah so of all of those words like are there drafts of 
worse words or do you arrive at those words pretty fast? At this point, I arrive at them pretty fast. When I was a, a newer comic, I would have to to write it out and 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 think about it. And we're really getting into the writing weeds here. But so that's I don't but know. that's the process is what yeah. people are interested in. Oh, that's good because I I could talk about that all day long. So, spigot was another word, but it was too many it was too many syllables, and also sounds too written. Right? Something that's not, oh, he spent too much time. You can tell. Spigot isn't something that we're using all the time. And then there's also, I've said steel spout, which is alliteration, but again, sounds too written and too rehearsed. And iron spout, for whatever reason, it, it flows better. But I know that one of my favorite quotes by Mark Twain, and, and I wonder if people of his generation used to say Mark, just Mark. <laughs> They probably said Twain. I think back then you would just say somebody's last name, but they said, he said, the difference between the right word and the almost right word is the difference between lightning and a lightning bug. There you go. The exact right word is is so important. So, so spout and then limit your quench. Yeah, that, that's just, I'm sure I ad libbed that one night because it's, it comes in a period, you, you, cert, you kind of figure out what your rhythm is at some point and how often punchlines come in your, in your act. And, and that was a, that was a moment where I, at some point I must have thought, oh, I need a laugh here. And I, and I came up with, with that. And, and quench is, is just, it's, I have a friend named, named Rick Harris from New Jersey who's a, was a comedian. And now I, I think he's an English professor, but he said, that what people really love is not words that they don't know, but words they forgot they knew. That's and hearing words that they hadn't heard in a long time. And, and, and I think there's, there's great truth in that. Yeah. One more in the weeds one. Oh, you good. Talk in the participation trophy section. Yes. By the way, I wholeheartedly agree with you. The people who are like, man, they should get no participation trophy. It's yeah. like, I hated Little League Baseball. I'm glad I got a participation. Yes, from, I hated yes, it. I, deserved I dreaded it. the ball being hit <laughs> yes. to me at every moment I was on the yes. field. I liked the hitting. I like yeah. hitting. I didn't yeah. like fielding. Yeah. Anyway, you have this moment where you take apart the quote, winning isn't everything. It's yeah. the only thing. You say, winning isn't everything. It's the only thing. Boy, there are a lot of other things. Like, what about pause? Yeah. And in that moment, the audience is like, what is he going to say? What's yeah. the other thing? And you say, what do you say? Collage. Collage. So, and collage is funny, sounds funny, Yeah. is like the opposite of sports and winning. Yes. What else is on the, like, what else was in that blank, if anything, before? Did it just go right to collage? It went right to collage. That's just, like, to me, in my head, there are like 90 things. No. Like, like, what about Frosties? What no. about miniature golf? What about no. video game? Just right to collage. It has to be something that the audience was not going to, to think. Or, or had, to, and, and even to the point of, oh yeah, that's right, that exists. It has to be the same, like I said, what my friend said about a word that they had forgotten about. And I thought to myself, what is the thing about me that most people would be surprised to know? And one is that one of my hobbies is collage. <laughs> I love to take the basketball cards that I grew up with that are not in great shape and and overlap them in themes. Like I have one really big one, which is all the players whose last name was Johnson in the 70s and 80s. And maybe into the 90s, because I remember Amir, or the 2000s, because Amir yeah. Johnson was on it too, yeah. So just, I just filled this thing with all the Johnsons, and it was it was awesome. <laughs> And then I had one with all the great 70s and, and 80s hair. Like there was great, there was great hair in the, in the 70s and 80s in, in basketball, especially in the ABA. So you and I are right in the perfect demographic of, we grew up where, with the NBA that looked a certain way. Yep. We have lived through this incredible transformation, which is going to end up being known as the Steph Curry slash Mike D'Antoni transformation of the right. NBA. Yes, but he's the Bill Walsh of of the NBA, I think. But we're but we're still young enough where we're sort of still in our prime as sports fans. We're not just sort of casually paying attention to it, and like oh, that doesn't look like the thing that I know. Blah yeah. blah. So, but so being in that demographic. What do you think of? Do you enjoy watching today's NBA as much as you did watching the one when you were a kid? I enjoy the NBA today for the same reason I enjoyed the NBA back then. The the 
or the things I enjoy about the NBA now are the same things that I love the most about the NBA in the in the eighties. I I don't mind that guys aren't aren't taking as many in between shots. What do they call them now? Mid range. Mid range. We used to call them outside shots. <laughs> It is true. There were three pointers and there were outside shots. So mid range. I, I I hate to use the vernacular when I'm when I'm not an expert, but but the mid range shot, the eighteen footers, the Purvis shorts, the Alex Englishes, the the guys who made their name off those mid range. They they played a beautiful game. Kiki Vandeway. It was still a beautiful game. And the fact that now they've, I can't imagine why it took them so long to realize the incentive about taking three pointers maybe they're just part of it is they're better at shooting long shots now than maybe they were back then but the 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 thing is is that i was watching the 84 championship series the other day on 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 a treadmill and the game seemed to exist in a much smaller portion of of half court back then it's astonishing yeah and now it exists over the entire area of the half court there's so much great spacing and i just love it my only question and i wanted to this was one of the things i i wanted to ask you is would there be a place for mikhail and parish in today's game or would they have to i think they would have created and worked hard enough to make a way but would their type of game been able to function in in the modern or the current game so maybe four years ago at grantland i wrote a story that was about it was like this is a eulogy for the post-up game but it's not really dying or it's not really dead by the numbers the number of post-ups just keeps dropping more and, yeah. more and more every year and particularly when you look at the number of possessions that are finished by somebody shooting right from a post-up but if you're really good at it teams have been smart now for years about using it as a hub to draw help and then kick out yes. like a, a, a little more difficult version of how the Rockets won the title around the Lajuan. Yeah. Like that's still going to happen. And I actually think it becomes more important in the playoffs where the best defenses, all the fancy that you can do, oh, pick and roll and kick and kick over right. here. Yeah, drive yeah, and yeah. Kick. The best defenses are going to be better at taking that stuff away. Yeah. And that's why the playoffs becomes more of a, I mean, think of the Cleveland Golden State finals. That whole finals was LeBron being like, okay, where's Steph Curry? How can I get myself matched up against the smallest guy on the yeah. floor? It becomes more of a mismatch game. So I right. think certainly there would be a place. For, I mean, McHale's like shot sixty percent from the field. I mean, yeah. if you can do that, there would be there will be a place for you. It's just it's a more complicated place now. The passes are harder to make because right. defenses can help in all these like zone-ish ways that they couldn't right. when McHale was playing. Right. But I do think. Like, the bad post-up players, you just are not allowed to do it anymore. Like, Dwight yeah. Howard's not allowed to do it anymore. Right. Bismack Biombo is not allowed to like, <laughs> one token jump hook every yes. five games. But the best guys are still going to do it, and I think it becomes more important. In the, I hope it becomes more important in the playoffs because I, I do worry a little bit about the game becoming homogeneous. Right. No, that's a, that's a great point. Yeah. I like watching good post-ups players play. There's an Me art too. to it. There's an Me art too. to it. Yes. And the, and they still have great footwork. The the great ones do. They still have excellent footwork. Not like Elijah Warren or or Mikhail, but Elijah Warren has taught a lot of these younger guys. Who do you like to watch this? Who have you enjoyed watching this season? Maybe you've been so overwhelmed by all the fallout from this, especially you haven't had any time to watch. No, no, no I've watched I've watched every Celtics game. Okay, okay, and then so I'm blown away by by. Tatum, Jalen, Gordon Hayward was all the way back until he hurt his hand, but I think he'll be, he'll be fine. Kemba Walker is, is, I, I don't want to fall into bashing Kyrie, but this is much better chemistry for that, for that team than, than Kyrie was, I, I think. And then I love some of the, the role players. Like when, when I was a kid, I, I loved a lot of the guys off, off the bench, but, but the, the Celtics have this, this guy named, which Williams? Grant, I bet it's going to be a Williams. Grant Williams. Grant Williams. Yeah. Is the power is the four. Is the power yeah. forward of the two Williams? And, and he's just I expected nothing from him, and he just every time he gets into the game, and then and then Brad Wanamaker, who's like one of the best stories in the in the NBA to have to have stuck with his dream till he's twenty nine to make the NBA. He played in Europe, which is significant, but it's not the NBA, and and it's just such a great story, and he's excelling in 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 Hayward's. Absence, and then I've watched Luca play several times because I, I, I've never, honestly, I've never seen him, anybody like him. And, and Harden the same, the same way. And then yeah, I, I've watched, anybody, I've watched the Lakers. There wasn't anyone 
dominating the ball in the same way as those two guys yeah. when we were growing up. Like not even Jordan just worked from a different geography yeah. on the floor. Those two guys are doing Luca and Harden are doing yeah. stuff that is and yeah. Luca like I was watching that game against the Lakers a couple of days ago. He just has for he's twenty. And he's like every time he makes a step back through yeah. he's turned into the crowd and talking yes. trash to him. I'm like, this guy just yes. has a li- like so much swagger. Yes. And his threes are not right behind the arc. No, they're he's... really fu- they're they're Steph type. And yeah, so I'm 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 blown away by him. The only thing I will say that I that I can't judge whether there was anybody like him or Harden growing up is that I never got to see Gervin more than one time a, a season. The Spurs were usually playing playoff games that weren't – even their playoff games weren't on, on national TV. So I didn't see Gervin that much. And and what I saw of, of World Be Free on Cleveland, he w- he wasn't the focus of the offense the way he was in, in, in San Diego. It's funny. This is the second George Gervin conversation I've oh, had really? today. I just came from another NBA-themed entertainment event, and we were talking, a few of us, about – the, the late seventies, early eighties NBA. I don't know if anyone would buy that book, but there's a great book to be written about, yes. like the Lou Hudson Hawks and oh the George Gervin Spurs, like yeah. just really good teams who never could quite get over the hump, but they were yeah. really good every year. They had characters and on those them. Nuggets it's kind of like post ABA merger. Yeah. Like I don't know if anyone yeah. would read that book, but there's a good book to be written about some of those. Like Gervin is a great Gervin. Like you look at his numbers, like oh my god. This guy was unbelievable, yes. and like, yes. but people like you, where you're growing up, you barely get to see George Gervin play. Hardly like, ever it, saw him. Maybe some highlights every once in a while, and and the 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 magazines. It was all about the the basketball magazines, the sporting news, Sports Illustrated. You would get some coverage, but not enough. Does the player movement bother you as a fan of an age where some people are bothered by the player movement, like guys changing teams all the time, and like you know trade demands and all these things that are becoming. Um, Hot button issues, let's say. It's, it's disappointing. It, it was ideal that we got to have Bird and McHale throughout their, their careers, but it, it was, the, the, the players are making a huge concession by even signing for, for more than a one year contract. They, I mean, if they, if they were going to the highest bidder like in every other business on, on earth, they could they could get so much more money. The salary cap. It's I don't think it, I don't think it's fair. And 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 uh, I mean I'm also talking. I just I just read the forty million dollar slaves again. And 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 Howard Bryant's book. I don't know if you read that. So I, I um he he wrote a, a great book about. I mean it's it's basically where where William Roden's book left off. And it, it was just incredible, and and yeah, so I think they're making a tremendous concession, even signing for three or four years. And and yes, I wish LeBron, Dwayne Wade, and and um, Chris Bosh hadn't had that team together because I think the Celtics could have won an, another one. But or the, but it, it's why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? They're that good. They des- they deserve that. I, I, that I doesn't bother me. I don't want to get into the weeds of all that stuff. Yeah. But what I always come back to when, when people are, are like, oh, that's players are ruining the league and taking over the league. I'm like, the, the players can get traded. Yes. The, yes. Players requesting trades or exercising yes. their freedom of movement power is not tipping the scales out of balance. It's just balancing the yes. scales because, like, obviously a team is not going to trade LeBron. A team by their own volition is not right. going to trade these players. Yeah. But they can be traded. Yeah. And, like, anyone outside the top five. Yes. You're – at risk of being traded yes. against your wishes all the time. Yes. Um, They've earned this. They have a very thin window to earn their money. I, I have no problem with it. Looking for some other great NBA podcasts? Download and subscribe to my friend Brian Windhorst and the Hoop Collective, as well as the Woj Pod, wherever you get your podcast. This week, Woj chats with Thunder GM Sam Presti. Not exactly the most frequent interview subject, by the way, about the war chest of draft picks the Thunder accumulated this summer. A couple more comedy questions. So before this special, the bit that you were most famous for yes. was obviously the quote-unquote documentary <laughs> about the collection of experts yes. who came up with the state abbreviations. Yes. Um, and it's if you this is on many versions of this are on YouTube. Right. People have already seen it probably. So two but questions. The Conan, the Conan version is the most popular. The I think it has popular. like thirty million views or something like that. It's amazing. Ridiculous. So. What's the origin of that? Well, 
the the origin is I had this great book called the Arrow Book of States when I was in second grade, and I memorized all the abbreviations. And the tricky thing was always that a lot of the a lot of the words weren't weren't the a lot of the abbreviations weren't obvious, right? Because so many states start with the same first two letters. So I really had to put in a long time to memorize all fifty. And I don't know why I did. It's the same reason I memorized the colleges of the entire NBA in nineteen eighty one. That that <laughs> that I that to this day I know that that Robert Parrish went to Centenary. Yep. And then Austin Carr played at Notre Dame, and and nobody cares. It doesn't matter. Yeah. They could Google it just like that, yeah. and and nobody is impressed. So I I. Memorized the abbreviating of the states, and then in 1993, I started comedy, and about nine months in, I said, I want to do that joke. It wasn't even a joke. I want to do the, I did all observation. I want to do the observation that most of the states start with the same first two letters, and I got, I knew that there was going to be an argument between the men abbreviating the states. So you go right to this fictional scenario. You yes. realize right away I yes. the thing itself is not funny enough. I have to create yes. a, a, a scenario that yes. makes it funny. I can't say comedy had already gone past. Did you ever notice? Right. I had to go past. Did you ever notice all the states start with the same first two letters and then the next step is to create a, a scene and then so that was 94 when I first tried it out in in front of a, a high school like show that I was getting paid twenty five or thirty dollars for, and it went well, but it was only like two sentences long, and and also I tried it a few more times and didn't get a good response, so I just shelved it, and then in around two thousand and eleven, I no two thousand six I came up with the idea of a man whose job it was to abbreviate things. And added him to it, tried it out a couple of times, nothing. A contractor. Yes. Yes. And that was not an ad lib, but a fail. The first time I said his job title, I said contractor. And I meant to say contractor, but everybody laughed when I said contractor, and and so I switched it. But anyhow, it wasn't until I saw the documentary Helvetica. I still haven't seen it. Helvetica is the subway font, right? Yeah. 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 I saw that documentary and it was amazing. And I thought, oh, you can make a, either film is cheap enough or documentaries are popular enough that you can do a documentary about just anything. And if it's, if it's compelling, people will watch it. And then, so one night while doing a joke about Helvetica, I said, and it was a complete lie, I said to the audience, have you seen this documentary about the men and, <laughs> The men who came up with the abbreviating of the states. And then I can't even explain, like any good writing, a lot of it, you can't even explain where the germ came from. It was, I mean, the Dottie character was just when we were in college, there were these guys who, one of the guys, his father was a plumber and he brought his father's tool set and started a, a, he tried to fix a leak and wound up flooding the entire hall with his father's tool set. And then he, as a joke, named the group of guys who had done this the Chief and Sons Plumbing Company. And there was this girl named Lisa who lived in our building. And he said, Lisa, you're the secretary, but you can't be Lisa because that's not a secretary name. You have to be Dotty. And for four wow. years, she was Dotty. Well, to this day, she's, she's Dotty. Dot- she's always Everybody that's calls her Dotty. Yeah. She didn't actually do anything as the secretary. <laughs> it was just this elaborate joke. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's what's so, so I had, I watched it again recently to prepare for this, and I had forgotten about uh, how you take, I mean, Dottie, I remembered, but the, the genius of the bit is that it takes all of these little side plots, because you're building a fake documentary. Yes. It's gotta have a lot, to sustain an hour and a half, it's gotta have right. a lot of plots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you build it, my favorite one that I totally forgot about was you build in the fact that they take a long break to have omelets, from an omelet station, right? Because in the sixties and seventies, the omelet station was like brand new, and it yes. was it was, <laughs> it was a fad. Yeah, it was sweeping the nation. So, yes. are there are there other 
ver- are there other fads that were tried out? Like, how do you land on omelet station? I just don't understand oh. the the process. Is just amazing to me. Yeah, it's it, it's something that my my comedian friend named Tom Ryan calls the parts store, where you have these fragments of jokes and ideas that never really made it into the into the act. So I knew that between Alabama and Alaska. I needed something to divert the attention from the fact that they had just come up with AL and they were going to do it again. And so I said that the guys were so excited that it was so easy. And that's the whole thing is that they have to have all this hubris about how easy it is to abbreviate the states. And then it's funnier when they have trouble with it and they get angrier and angrier. And I had this joke about how omelet chefs were were surly and resentful because they didn't want to just be making omelets which anybody can make an omelet you had that joke like existing in a separate it came from a vacation i took in which i could tell that the omelet chef hated me and my girlfriend would go (laughs) get an omelet every morning she'd say you love omelets why won't you get an omelet and i said the omelet chef hates me and i said and why why wouldn't she she didn't want to be the omelet chef and i'm (laughs) i'm bossing her around and i thought that was funny and i would tell that as a joke and nobody would ever laugh and the whole thing was that in that joke it doesn't have to be funny it just has to make people forget that i had just abbreviated alabama and by the time we get to alaska wow. they've had this whole story so it was just a it was just something i lifted from the part store and if it it couldn't lose it could have been anything I didn't know that it was a it was a whole separate joke. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. It was a bad joke. Last one, and then I'll let you go. Oh you're, yeah, you're a very busy man. But this was this was awesome, man. There was just one basketball question that I had to ask you. Go. One one was the 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 Mikhail Parish question, and then the other one is I've noticed that the Celtics beat a lot of teams in the fourth quarter. Okay, and at first I was like, maybe they're better conditioned than all the other teams. But then I thought, no, conditioning is conditioning a commodity in in the NBA that every team is conditioned so well and you're not gonna win that way. But then I, I see guys like like our friend on the on the, the Nuggets who doesn't seem to be in great yeah. in great shape. I love Nicole, he's my, yeah. maybe my favorite player to watch. Oh he's so fun league. to watch, he, but he I think he could better, be in yeah. better shape. So is is conditioning a commodity that everyone is conditioned the same, or are the Celtics making making a difference with their condition? Now, I don't know if the Celtics are, but I, I do think both on the individual level, like you just named one guy, I think Embiid is another guy who's, whose conditioning is a subject of, of yeah. much discussion. Right. Um, but my, my go-to example is, um, I, do you know a player named James Johnson? Yeah. Uh, kind of a multi, so he, he, and he's, he, he's like fought MMA, like he's a legit real athlete. Oh, I didn't and know Not that, that basketball players aren't real athletes, they right. are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's like, you could put him into any sport yeah. and he would be good at it. Right. He went, f- we went to the Heat. And, uh, the Heat have a famous conditioning program. Like, they will, they will, they suspended James Johnson this year early oh. in training camp for failing to pass conditioning tests, and he was like in good shape. Yeah. He goes to the Heat, and then stories come out after his first season with the Heat. James Johnson has lost 30 pounds. And I'm like, I didn't think James Johnson had to lose like two pounds. Right. He lost 30? And I asked him about that. I was like, you lost 30 pounds? Like, yeah, there are some guys you look at, like, like, I like a couple months ago. I was like, I could lose thirty pounds. Like I'm just a <laughs> schmuck. Like I could lose. 30. Like I looked at you. Like you're like a perfect specimen of an athlete. You need to lose thirty pounds. And he was like, I didn't know, and I feel like unbelievable. I feel right. like he's like I feel like a superhero. And so I do think there are degrees of it, and okay. that it's a real thing. Why the Celtics are winning in fourth quarter is that it's a good question. I think having a lot of good perimeter players who don't yeah. turn the ball over a lot right. probably helps. Um, yeah. But there is an interesting sort of burbling discussion about the Celtics of like you have these teams at the top of the East now. Boston's better than people expected. Toronto is the best story in the whole league. Yeah. Like, um, Philly, Milwaukee, where Miami's better than expected. Indiana is hats off to the Pacers. They're playing unbelievable yes. considering their injuries. Um, and looking ahead to the playoffs, I think it's a fair and interesting question to ask about the Celtics is, are they a better regular season team than a playoff team? Do they have an extra level to get to? Right. Or are they maximizing what they are? Now, Hayward is hurt, obviously, but even when he was playing, are they maximizing what they are? And that's, like I think, a fancier version of saying when they play Boston, when they play Milwaukee and Philadelphia for sure, 
the other teams you could maybe debate it, they won't have the best player in that playoff series, right? right. And so like you, right. the playoffs sometimes come down to like who's got the best guy. Yeah. And so that that's so the Celtics are are really good are are, ex, are a good execution team. Like right. they make they make hay because they execute really well. They play hard all forty eight minutes. And the value of those things diminishes in the playoffs because everyone is doing yeah. those things. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. Well, the last thing I wanted to ask you, if yes. you will allow me, oh, of course, was you have a, a side bit. You have a in the special. You have a you, we we get out of the special and you're talking to uh, Robert Kelly, one of yes. comedian friends, and you have a great discussion about the I- idea that comics are um, screwed up people, depressed yeah. people whatever their malady is they're emotionally unstable <laughs> and that if they become emotionally stable they won't yeah. be funny anymore now i didn't expect that to be in the special it is a sort of pervasive thought and you guys come out like i i expected it to be sort of a yeah, i didn't know where the discussion was going i didn't expect you to come out and be like not only is that not true the opposite is true yeah i'm funnier because i'm better do you, is that still all these months later? Do you still feel that way? Oh my gosh. Yes. That was really interesting to me. Yeah. Em- em- empirically, I can just point to the, to the production and the, cr- in, in creativity. So I got sick, I would say maybe the spring of 2015. And from that point until the fall of 2017, I wrote I'll be generous and say I wrote 10 minutes of, of jokes, five minutes of which I did on Colbert and the other jokes wound up in the, in the special in a, in a way too. So 10 minutes. And since I started to feel better that, that summer, so from 2000, fall of 2017 until now, I finished another 40 minutes of the great depression that made it in there. A half hour that we couldn't use and I don't want to do again on, on my tour. Plus an hour and a half that I'm touring with now, so that's that's over two and a half hours of material while I was while I was healthy. The only thing different was that I wasn't spending most of my day in in bed or or worrying or or angst ridden. So so that I mean that's anecdotal. It's one person, but I know Robert in that in that interview said that he's written better since he's gotten healthy. And I know over the years certain comedians and and performers have gotten sober, which I think is a similar thing to mental illness and the recovery and the and the clear mindedness that you get when you're when you're sober. And I think most of the people say they they have done some of their best work. And and there are writers over the years who would say I could only write when I was drunk. But I, I don't they they were never out of it, so it's not really clear whether they whether they ever had the opportunity and, and what their ages were and, and whether being drunk all the time made them less, um, took away their longevity. It, it, part of it is that being, <clears throat> being funny, part of being funny for you or part of being whatever for me is like actually producing stuff. Yes. Like if you can't, it yes. doesn't matter. If you can't produce stuff, it yes. doesn't matter yes. like what the, the little trickles that are coming out might right. be funny, but if you can't yeah. produce it, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, yeah. you know? But also when you're depressed, you're so critical of your work that a lot of it you wouldn't even release. You would say, this is and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not letting it go. So I, th- I think that's another part of it that you, I'm, I'm not, I seldom say, oh, this is great, but I'm more objective in my opinion of, of my work now than when I was depressed. The, uh, the same joke while I was depressed would, would get a, ugh, it's not, it's not good at all. It's useless. And when I'm feeling well, I say, no, this is pretty good. And, and it, it at least deserves a chance. Deserves a chance. All right. Yeah. Gary Goldman, the special for people who haven't seen it is called The Great Depression. It's available on HBO. It is sensationally funny and also emotionally moving, which is a difficult <laughs> thing to accomplish in the same thing. And I, I'm just thrilled that we got to do this. I'm thrilled that the special has, it has had this ripple effect for your career and your, yeah, build I'm on really it. grateful for that. And, and thank you so much for making this happen. I've been a big fan for a long time. You so made to, it happen. So I just, all I did was bas- ask, but seriously to talk basketball with, with Zach Lowe is, is a dream come true. So thank you. Stop it. Watch the special. It's hilarious. You will not regret spending an hour and 20 minutes of your life doing it. Gary Goldman. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. The Low Post is presented by Goodyear. Discover the possibilities. Goodyear, more driven.